Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm your host, Michael Dowd, and in this conversation recorded in June of 2021, I speak with Eric Michaels. Eric has become a cherished colleague. Few people bring together all of the things that I've been studying for the last eight years better than Eric. And his blog is Problems, Predicaments, and Technology. I first uh, encountered Eric on the Methane News Group on Facebook. And um, you'll find that he's, he's absolutely brilliant and is a great writer and um, says things in a way that I think needs to be said. Here you go. I wanted to just start by just inviting you for people that are watching this or listening to this and who don't know who you are, uh, have not become familiar with your blog, uh, Problems, Predicaments, and Technology, or you know, any of your other work, help us get you. Like share, share a little bit about who you are and what you're particularly known for or passionate about so that folks can understand who is this guy, Eric Michaels, that I'm talking to. Well, the... Uh... I guess the first thing that most people, at least in the doomer community, so to speak, uh, would recognize me as a person who is an admin in uh, both the Prepping for NTHE group and the Methane News group. Uh, those are two of the groups I'm probably the most active in. Uh, the Peak Oil group is another one. Um, some folks might uh, know me from... Uh, Rise for Climate, and uh, basically, um, just like you and, and, well, I assume probably millions of other folks, um, you know, I knew about climate change uh, pretty much from high school, many, many moons ago, but, um, but I wasn't aware of all the aspects of energy and resource decline. Uh, I did not uh, have an appreciation yet for all of the physics and thermodynamics, uh, of the system, uh, and I did not realize that we were uh, more or less kind of uh, condemning ourselves to extinction over the long haul. And, uh, and of course, just like everybody else, I went through a, a period of grief, uh, all the classic symptoms. Uh, first thing I did when I learned about NTHE, well, I didn't even know what the, what the initial stood for. I, I was in a climate group, and I was reading this thread, and it's like, NTHE, what is that? You know, and I, I, I had learned all these, uh, you know, euphemisms like LOL and, and right. LMAO, laughing my ass off and all this stuff. And it's like, NTHE, I don't remember that one. How was it? So, of course, you know, I had to Google it. And uh, first thing that popped up was Dave Pollard's uh, site. And, um, and, and I just went, I went down the rabbit hole big time. Yeah. And um, first thing I did was spend about, Oh, probably 45 days trying to disprove uh, NTHE. You know, it's like, well, we can't possibly go extinct. I mean, we're humans, you know. And, 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 and for anybody who's watching or listening to this that isn't familiar with that yet, it's near term human extinction, NTHE. Right, I'm right. Continue. Sorry. And then um, the, uh, of course, I learned about hubris and anthropocentrism and anthropo. Uh, uh, you know, the, all of that and um, being self-centered and, and thinking only in terms of humans versus all the other life that surrounds us. And, and too many people just don't have an appreciation for the simple fact that all that life actually is what supports us. And <laughs> we, we, we need that life. Uh, that other life out there does not need us, unfortunately. So uh, a lot of people are, are kind of uh, not really well aware of that, those facts. So, and, and I think that's another thing. Uh, so many people worry about their feelings and things that really aren't fact-based. And, uh, and so I, my, one of my efforts is to try to point out the facts versus, well, this is what we believe in, or this is what we feel, or, you know, well, and this it's is like, what we hope for. <laughs> right, right. And it's like, well, you know, those are all fine and dandy, but beliefs really, the science doesn't care what your beliefs are. <laughs> that's, that's my whole point. It's sort of like, yeah, but, you know, I mean, if you read this stuff, it's, it's, it gives you a whole new perspective and uh, kind of wakes you up to how society works, 
Uh, the fact that we are part of a much larger system and that the system of society, the system of civilization, the system, uh, the climate system, for instance, you know, a lot of people just do not appreciate, for instance, just one, one aspect, um, uh, uh, oceanic thermal heat. You know, they, they don't realize how huge that, I mean, you know, and, and how much heat is actually stored there, you know, and I think a lot of people are under the uh, illusion that somehow we would be able to, and, and there are ways to do it, you know, if we were able to continuously explode thermonuclear weapons, for instance, over a period of maybe five or 10 years, we might be able to kick up enough dust into the atmosphere and create a, a nuclear winter for ourselves. But obviously that's going to kill off just, I mean, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. There's no, that's not a, a winning uh, strategy <laughs> by any means. My, hang on a second. My, my phone is ringing and I want to turn it off. Sure. Sure. I, Those phones are something else, aren't they? <laughs> well, yeah. And I use mine actually like a flip phone. It's a, it's a smartphone. It's, it's, you know, an iPhone, but I use talk to text, but that's the, pretty much the only thing I do with it. I don't use it like a computer. I don't want to know. <laughs> To know how to do it that way. Oh, there you oh, yeah, go. Nice. go. I've, I've got the old, old-fashioned uh, big got, buttons, and you've got the exact same model that I had until I got this because my daughter just had a had a daughter. So I've now got a one-year-old granddaughter, and I wanted to do talk to text to her, and I couldn't do it with that. But that's the exact phone that you have is the phone that I had. Uh, I've I, I kind of I, I don't really feel the necessity to have a oh, smartphone. Agree. And I, I, I was, I'm the kind of guy, I used to be really into all the technology and, oh, I had to have all the newest, latest gadgets and, and um, well, and then I started learning about uh, all those minerals and where they come from and yep. how these things are produced and the amount of energy required to do it. And the fact that it requires mining and exactly. energy use and civilization to begin with. So exactly. it's sort of like, do I really need, what, what can I do without, you know, you start asking yourself these questions about how can I reduce uh, the damage that I'm doing? Yeah, and, no, uh, exactly. Exactly. Well, that leads me to, I, I mean, uh, anything else you want to say? Because we were interrupted when my phone rang. Uh, you were well, saying about... As, as far as me being a professional MC, um, I, uh, I got started in the eighth grade. I, was, uh, I did my first uh, dance for the newspaper uh, of, our, of our class that year, uh, the newspaper group. We, we were uh, young journalists or whatnot. And... Um, I actually wrote a lot of articles, but my my real love was music and dancing and so forth. And so that's kind of what got me and started with that. Uh, my freshman year, I did a few more dances, my sophomore year more, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I also, uh, as a 13-year-old... Uh, How old are you now? Uh, I'm 54 now. Okay. Um the uh, when I was 13, I bought my first stereo system and for a for an eighth grader uh, having a an 80 watt per channel stereo with 15 inch uh, floor standing speakers was really something kind of unusual. You know, I mean, uh, my parents weren't real fond of my music for the most part, <laughs> you know, shaking the, the kitchen cabinets and and bouncing stuff around the house was not uh, one of their, I, I got 15 minutes every night was when I was allowed to, to do it. But, but anyway, um, over time, of course, I expanded that and I built even larger speakers, uh, bought larger amplifiers, more equipment, mixers, turntables, uh, everything was vinyl to start out with. And then I switched over to CDs in the uh, late eighties and early nineties, uh, like most other DJs. And, um, of course, I kept adding more and more services. I got involved with doing the music for ceremonies. Um, I became ordained in 2004. And at the time, that was nothing more than a spiritual journey. I wasn't, uh, sure. I, there was no, no, no connection to Megasound at all. Megasound is my, my company. Um, and then uh, I decided, uh, well, I, I, 
I, what happened is we were doing a ceremony and the minister didn't show up at all. And it's like, of course, the bride was a mess. And, you know, of course, my thought was, how can you not show up? I mean, that, that, is, that is so irresponsible. I mean, I'm sure there was a, a valid reason of some sort, but how can you do that to somebody's wedding? You know, they so many DJs, MCs and officiants really don't have an appreciation for just how important a person's wedding is. Oh, no. Exactly. And, and so and when you're spending that kind of money, you know, that's you expect them to actually be there on time, ready well, to go. Having, and, having uh, done about 35 weddings or 40 weddings in my life, I do know. I've I've done over 2000. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I've, I, you know, I started out very early and, and, yeah. uh, and I was doing, and, and I'm still doing it. You know, yeah. I don't, uh, we closed down the reception side of the business last year before the pandemic right. actually got going. Um, and, and I'm kind of thankful in, in effect for that because, uh, you know, I, I, I did hear from other DJs who really were, having a tough time, not making any money, um, you know? And so, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm really thankful in that sense, but uh, the other side of it is the fact that a lot of what happened and the reasoning behind why we had to do that has to do with energy and resource decline exactly. and a lack of surplus energy, which is, has caused, of course, lower uh, wages and across the board. And of course, inevitably, it's not just lower wages, but inflation has made the actual value of a dollar so much less that kids today are, they don't have anywhere near the kind of money. I mean, I was, I was poor at their age too, but they, they don't have anywhere near what I had. Yeah, and exactly. um, they, they just couldn't afford our services. So I was constantly getting this, well, you know, so-and-so over here is only five or $600. And it's like, well, what do you want for your wedding? Do you want, you know, do you want quality service with somebody that really knows what they're doing? They have backup equipment, liability insurance. They have an office that you come to and, and sit down and talk to them. I mean, somebody that's established basically over yeah. a, a kid who really doesn't know what they're doing. And, um, and, but, you know, the other thing I think is a generational uh, difference where, Kids think, oh, that guy's that's some old fogey. Forget that, you know. <laughs> and and so uh, trying to fight those is is uh, well. June and I just decided it was becoming too much of an issue. Plus, when you get old, that equipment gets really heavy. And yeah, so, no, exactly, exactly. What was your worldview growing up? Uh, when did you start getting things like climate? You mentioned obviously early on, but you know, when did you start getting the severity of it? Um, when if did you ever have a sense of perpetual progress and if so when did that shift how traumatic was that so give us a sense uh those who are watching or listening to this conversation of your story and how you came to the worldview and your understanding of what i would call a post doom place like move through the freak out and doom and you pretty much regularly hang out in what I would call a post-doom space. Story. Well, uh, my freshman year in high school, uh, I learned about climate change. And of course, at that point in time, everything was, oh, nothing bad's going to happen until 2100 and blah, blah. You, you've heard that story a million times, I'm sure. Um, but the point uh, was that it's, it's going to be serious. And I assumed, uh, like most young kids uh, who are idealistic and, and have all kinds of good thoughts about everything, that uh, the scientists and the politicians would fix, fix all the problems and everything would be fine by 2100. You know, it'd be long after I passed away, but uh, I, I kind of figured that, uh, you know, they would take care of things or at least get started, at least get started. That was where uh, inevitably I was very frustrated in the 80s. Um, you know, I followed very closely Hansen's uh, testimonial to Congress. Uh, I followed uh, developments after that, uh, things like the, um, of course, the uh, um, accords that were going through and, and uh, different climate meetings and so forth and so on. Um, the COP meetings, of course, uh, Conference of the Parties, 
which, um, well, you know, <laughs> by now those those things are more or less kind of jokes. Or, yeah, they are. Or anything they really else. Are. I really, uh, I really feel that they're they they've kind of they've veered off into a whole different uh, program that not really designed to do anything worthy of actually helping climate change one way or the other. But, you know, I, I was, that, that was frustrating. And sure. I, all the while I kept seeing emissions rise year after year. And it's like, why aren't we doing something about this? Why is this, you know, population, um, energy use, everything just kept going up. Now, inevitably, like many people, I, I never stopped to think very critically about it. Um, so yeah, uh, up until probably up until the two thousands, I was one of those folks that, you know, perpetual progress and perpetual motion machines and all that, all that other nonsense that, you know, infinite growth on a finite planet. I mean, um, it just doesn't work, of course. And once, once a person is, uh, opens their mind to the science they learn very quickly that, wow, we are on a collision course with a brick wall <laughs> and we're and it's not too far away. That's, you know, um, of course, inevitably, I think a lot of things now are speeding up because of the fact that we reached peak oil in October of 2018. That is going to make definitively uh, a lot of the predicaments that we face now much worse. And, and much quicker than I think most people are willing to um, either agree to or agree with or, or I mean, no, but nobody wants to know these things. I, you know, it's funny. Some people think for whatever reason that I'm some sort of like fossil fuel shill or something like that, or, or that I actually enjoy telling these stories. And it's like, no, how could anybody enjoy this stuff? This isn't, this isn't really delightful knowledge by any stretch. I mean, this is uh, this is killing life. Period. I mean, not just us, but other life on this planet as well. Now, of course, inevitably, I think the tardigrades will survive. Um, I think extremophiles will survive, uh, especially the fungus that uh, eats the radioactive stuff at Chernobyl. But uh, but overwhelmingly, all large organisms will most likely die out. I mean, things are going way too quickly, and and I don't think people have an appreciation that climate change and ecological overshoot is an exponential uh, rise. It's not a it's not a nice nice clean slope like a linear rise. And well, well, um, well I'm curious, Eric, where, where when did you or where and how did you uh, gain sort of an ecocentric, a life centered rather than an anthropocentric uh, perspective. Where did you encounter either William Catton's overshoot or William Reese? I mean, people who are clearly coming from an understanding of the difference between problems and predicaments, the diff, you know ecological overshoot. Uh, you write so elegantly about that stuff, and and it sounds like you didn't have that understanding until the 2000s somewhere. So how did that come about? How did you come into an ecological understanding of reality? Well, uh, my first exposure to <laughs> the reality of of that things aren't really as great as you think they are, uh, was in 2009. Uh, at the time, I had uh, kind of gone on this little uh, Netflix uh, binge, if you will, of documentaries. I was, and I still love documentaries to this day. Uh, sure. Documentaries are just so fascinating. Yep. And I will choose a documentary any day of the week over some silly novel type story, you know, um, oh, we, we, you know, let me just pause for a second. We just watched one last night that was really, really good. Um, and it's called Dark Waters. Um, and Mark Ruffalo is both the producer and he plays the main character uh, about how it was discovered that Teflon, basically, how, you know, the, these, these forever chemicals, and how DuPont, you know, it, it, it's a really, really powerful. Yeah, good yeah. Yes, no, exactly. Yeah, in fact, uh, I was visiting uh, in North Carolina last year, the DuPont State Forest, and they still have a lot of foundations from the old buildings that stood there and everything. Uh, beautiful area. One of the reasons they, they tore most of it down and, and sold the property to, to the state 
was because of all the waterfalls and beautiful uh, paths and so forth that they had there. But, uh, but yeah, it's really interesting uh, stuff. I, I wrote that down. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, dark but, water. Uh, the, um, uh, and, and of course, on my blog, I have a lot of material regarding PFASs in the pollution loading uh, file. So uh, there's there's that. But anyway, um, you need a better index. Your your blog, I didn't find it easy to find the, the you got so much stuff there, but it took me quite a while to figure out how to navigate that. It would be great if you could have like a uh, uh, what's, what's it called? Like a map of your site or something like, you know, I forget what it's called, but, but, but some way, some way to easy access it because I was, it took me quite a while and I was persistent, but a lot of people wouldn't even know, you know, they think, Oh, he's got a few blog posts here, but they wouldn't know the depth of your stuff. I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. Well, I actually share a lot of the articles in the groups that I'm a part of, oh, sure. uh, and, and that's where most of them read it. And right. the files that are that are on the blog originally came from the groups. No, I and, know you mentioned that. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, uh, but how I got started uh, was uh, Michael Rupert's, uh, rest in peace, uh, his documentary called Collapse. I've seen it. And, that was uh, <laughs> that was when I first learned about peak oil. I'd never even heard of that. It's like peak oil. What's this? And uh, well, when I discovered that Marion King Hubbard uh, had predicted very accurately that the U.S. would reach their peak in 1970, and this is what where of course inevitably the uh, the peak was, uh, and and when companies started going downhill with what they provide and offer and so forth and so on to people. And, and so that, that lack of surplus energy just kept getting more and more and more to where we are today. Um, you know, we're spending so much energy just extracting the energy that we're using. Right. And, um, and of course, inevitably over time, it's, it's going to disappear and it's going to disappear a lot quicker than I think most people are, are cognizant of. I completely agree. So, but, uh, so that really, that was my first uh, episode into uh, the Dumosphere, if you will. And then, um, then I got, uh, well, I was, I was in a, a group, uh, this was kind of a, uh, oh, this group was so infused with hopium, it wasn't even funny. It was called the Global Warming Fact of the Day. And it was, uh, well, I mean, don't get me wrong. They had some good things in there, a lot of interesting articles about climate change, but um, their focus was really on technology and stuff that's just not going to actually work. And they, they, they hyped it up so much in that group, I finally left. But, but that's, where, that's where I learned about NTHE, near-term human extinction. And, um, and, and of course, I didn't even know what, it, what the, the initials stood for at the time. Uh, so I had to Google it. And, uh, well, uh, Dave Pollard's site came up and I learned about Carolyn Baker and Guy McPherson and, and pretty much, uh, well, all the people, Michael Rupert, all the people. And, and I started watching the videos and listening to podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, reading uh, peer-reviewed studies that, were, that they would mention. And uh, well, I, you know, I just kind of, that's where I kind of more or less came, came of my own. Um, over time, it just, I, I just kept absorbing more and more. And there's, uh, it's. And, and how, and how did, the, I'm curious, I just want to, uh, how did, are, you're married, correct? No, no, I'm single, actually. Oh, I do okay. have a significant other, but I'm not, I'm not leaving. Okay, so, so how did your partner at that time, or how did your family, like how, the people who were close to you, um, you know, how did their relationship shift, or did they come on board with you, or did you not talk about this stuff with them? Like, give oh, us... no, I, I talked about it uh, constantly. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, this, I can't, uh, I can't keep, things like that to myself uh, yes. i have to uh i don't know what you would call it but sort of uh cleanse yourself so to speak you know uh and and that actually helps uh with the grief uh you know talking about it with others is is very beneficial i find um keeping holding it inside to be very 
toxic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Uh, we have to talk about it. And that's why, that's why these groups, uh, I actually very quickly, once I discovered uh, that group, I very quickly joined a near-term human extinction support group. Mm -hmm. And the leader of that group uh, found me to be, well, he, he understood my leadership qualities and he decided to uh, put me on as an, as an admin. And so I, I did that. I did that very well for eight months. And then I found out that this guy was really not real, very supportive of the members. You know, he was kicking them out if they didn't do what he wanted and so forth. And, and I decided, yeah, this is, this, this, you know, this needs to stop. I, I shouldn't be supporting that. And so uh, uh, one of the admins and I uh, formed our own group. And uh, I helped her run that group for another, oh gosh, it was probably four or five years. And then, um, and then I, uh, in 2018, I got my own group and I've been running that ever since. It actually was kind and of given which to group, me. Which group is that? It's called Prepping for NTHE. Okay. And it's, you know, I remember the, when I first joined it, uh, actually I was added to the group by this person who at the time was running it. And um, at first I didn't pay much attention to it because like prepping, how can, how can you prep for NTH? It seemed kind of silly. And then I thought, the more I thought about it though, the more I thought, well, there is preparations that can be done. Things like mentally preparing yourself and psychologically stealing yourself for these uh, facts. And, and of course, th there is the, the regular physical prepping, like, uh, you know, building up resilience, uh, exactly. you know, storing food. Getting uh, to know your neighbors. Growing, <laughs> yeah, growing a garden, yes, exactly. um, you know, reducing your carbon footprint and so forth and so on. Things that, that anybody can do and, and, and that might help somewhat. I mean, obviously, yeah. it's not going to change the trajectory much, but... Uh, inevitably, every every little thing helps, and if and it, it's not so much the outcome, uh, I think it's more the journey itself. Exactly. Um, you don't have to be guaranteed that that we're going to survive. Let's let's just say we're not going to survive. Everybody dies, and you never know when when your time is up. So if you utilize that to your uh, advantage exactly. and live now, live right now and love now. Um, so many people forget what that means. They don't understand it. Live and love now. What's that all about? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. How many people put off, procrastinate doing things just because, well, it's not the right time or I've got a full-time job. I can't do that kind of stuff. Sure you can. And of course, inevitably, quit putting those things off. If you want to do it, do it now. Quit waiting. What are you waiting for? I mean, <laughs> and, 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 and I also encourage people to find something that, that, that nourishes your soul or yourself or your deep, you know, like it, that gives you a sense of purpose or meaning or, you know, where you can contribute to the larger body of life. It doesn't have to be humans, but where you can contribute in some way that just nourishes you. We all can do that. Exactly. I, I love getting out in nature and hiking. I, I spend a lot of time walking through forests and, and paths and trails. I love them. Uh, and I, I, I'm a mountain freak and a tree freak. And, uh, and I, I admit it, I admit it. But um, overwhelmingly, that was, that was pretty much how I got into all of this. And um, I, actually, I actually enjoy um, posting these articles I enjoy bringing the science into the group for everyone to, to check out, uh, either read or watch the videos. I post a lot of your videos. Um, and so um, it's a situation where I think that not only helps me, but it also helps many of the other people kind of uh, with the grief and so forth and so on. Because a lot of them, uh, I, I see it. I, in fact, I, I know one guy, uh, he, he kind of... Uh, uh, lost his uh, significant other. She has uh, a severe form of PTSD and she kind of went AWOL, so to speak. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but. Oh yeah. You know, and, and he, he actually was a fellow electrician too. He, he did the, the solar panels and he knows, 
he knows all the same stuff I do about all the technology and everything. Uh, he's pretty vocal about it too, on, on how that's not really going to save you. So, but you know, it's, 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 I think that's important as to where you can have an impact. And that's, that's one of my main hopes with this is to uh, bring more people, bring more information to more people, just like what you're trying to do. I, I'm a, a, a very much an admirer of, of what you've done here. It's, it's really, truly awesome. Well, thank you. I, and I think the same of yours. So say a little bit about what your vision is, what you're proud of about your, you know, problems, predicaments, and technology blog is really quite a collection of awesome stuff. So say something about that. Well, it actually came about as a means to get away from some of Facebook's ridiculous rules. Um, the, the problems I was having in the groups was that, of course, every week I would edit all the files and add all of the new studies articles, videos, and so forth that I had found the previous week. And uh, Facebook started punishing me because I was editing too many files. You know, they, it, I'd get this little message, slow down, you know, and stuff like that. And one, one week I actually got banned for, uh, because they, they considered it spam. And it's like, this is not spam. This is, you know, of course, it's Facebook bots. It's, you know, you're right, arguing with machinery there. But anyway, uh, I decided finally that I needed to come up with a solution and get uh, get some of my material off of Facebook so that only only I had access and control over it. And I didn't need to worry about how many times I edited it. If I wanted to add something today or tomorrow or next week or next month, I'd be fine. And so, um, uh, of course, I, I had my own blog for the Mega Sound. I had my own blog for Treasured Traditions which is a uh, kind of a collaboration with my office manager, uh, just artwork uh, stuff. She, she makes these little gnomes and so forth. And I actually do a lot of woodworking myself and so forth. In fact, the table that the tablet's on right now, I built myself. It's, uh, I don't know, I guess I should, I don't know if you can, can you see it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, that's nice. Good work. <laughs> so yeah, it's. Uh, uh, now the, you're upside uh, down. Pardon? Oh You're yeah. Upside down. How do I do <laughs> fix that? I don't know. Wait a minute. I know how to do this, right? There we go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Needless to say, I'm not not real super familiar with Zoom yet, but yeah, but I'm yeah. it's growing on me. So uh, so yeah, you know the uh, the purpose of the blog then became well once I posted all the files and everything. I decided I, I, I should probably write, uh, well, first I wanted to post some of the articles I had already written in the groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and my point at that uh, juncture was to try to get people to realize that some of these ideas they have about technology and uh, solving things and so forth needed, needed to be tamped with a little bit of reality, okay? And, um, and I didn't, you know, it's not to make them feel bad or anything, but to get them to a new reality of exactly. that's probably just not in the cards. You know, exactly. uh, too many people think that, you know, uh, carbon offsets and net zero and green energy and all this nonsense uh, is actually going to solve climate change. Right. Right. And um, unfortunately, the only thing that's actually, well, there isn't anything that's going to solve it. No, it's a prediction. Exactly. It, it has an outcome. But the thing that they need to be aware of is even if we were able to reduce emissions uh, completely, stop, full stop, all emissions, anthropo, uh, anthropocentric emissions right now, or anthropogenic, um, it, it still wouldn't matter. No, exactly. The ocean is too big. The system itself is too big. Climate change would continue for hundreds, if not thousands of years, long after the people who are alive today are long gone. So uh, the idea that reducing emissions is somehow going to save us is. Yeah, I, I call it I call it idolatry of human agency. Right. Yeah, it's pure hubris. Uh, and now I understand that, you know, the industries involved 
and the governments involved want to uh, kind of keep this idea right. rolling because uh, that's what keeps the economy going and business as usual and keeps fattening up the uh, profits and so forth for all the, the top people. But, uh, but it doesn't help uh, any of us, really. Uh, it doesn't help the other creatures that we share this planet with. And all it does is continue using the planet as a huge sink for Absolutely. pollution. And, and of course, you know, all, all of that too. So it's just, uh, it, my point is to get real information out. So people aren't misguided into thinking that we're going to have all these magical, uh, you know, devices. I mean, th think about it. I've seen the, the thing where they came out with these artificial trees. It's like oh, artificial God, I trees. I know. What is wrong with real trees? Yeah. It took me a long time to reach what I consider to be a, a holistic view. Yeah. Um, one that uh, kind of covers the, uh, the everything, you know, the ecological perspectives, the climate perspectives, the pollution perspectives, the energy and resource decline perspectives. Um, so I would work on one section at a time until I felt that I was comfortable uh, understanding all of the material that I had covered and read and, and watched. And I'm still, I'm I, just like you, yeah. I still learn every single day. Absolutely. There's new stuff, uh, just like I mentioned before uh, about the trees in Georgia. Um, there's, there's never a day that goes by that I don't see something brand new that's like, oh, here we go again, something new that I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Well, and that's why I now hold you as such a cherished colleague because I, I want to learn from you and I want to be in exchange uh, in a sort of a dance. In fact, I could imagine us collaborating or co-creating or co-authoring co something just because there's such an overlap of, of, of perspective that I find valuable. Well, I don't want this to go on too long because Connie will never edit it if it's too long. And um, uh, I just want to invite you because since you did see the questions that I have on the conversations page, the post doom site, and you did some thinking and jotting notes about that, anything that you would like to say uh, about sort of the next three questions I would normally ask human nature, like how does, you know, your sense of our inborn strengths and limitations affect your interpretation of our societal and cultural deterioration. Um, and then also the big picture, sort of how, how sort of this larger epic of evolution, big picture, how is that either, is it something that you've even explored? And if you have, how has it been helpful? And then, then it will get to impermanence and death, but certainly anything you want to say uh, on, on those two questions. Sure, sure. Well, as far as human nature goes, um, this, this is kind of an interesting question. Uh, I have an innate ability to focus on a specific topic and ignore extraneous stimuli. Well, I mean, usually anyway, I mean, and I think that this has probably helped me to gain an intricate comprehension of, of more or less what we face. Um, and the only way I know that is because my office manager, who I share this office with, she, uh, she gets distracted by everything. And I was like, I, I used to always, it used to annoy me. It's like, why are you allowing all these interruptions and stuff. It's like, focus on this. You know, this is what we're working on here. But in reality, though, I mean, it's the appreciation of other people who see these strengths in me, uh, as I've never really seen it from the perspective that they do. Yeah. And, uh, and I've always been this way. And I, I used to mistakenly assume for many years that everybody had these strengths, the same strengths. You know, I uh, I actually thought that everyone had the same basic levels of intelligence uh, with with additional strengths in particular areas, of course. But I mean, uh, I think I that that illusion was shattered my freshman year in high school once uh, once I figured that why well, I discovered that I was ninth out of my class of 410. So it's like, eesh, uh, I'm a little bit smarter than some of these folks here. But now, obviously, they're there are uh, different levels of intelligence. So, yeah, no, you know. there's different, what, different things. I mean, I, I was influenced back in the day by Howard Gardner's frames of mind and, you know, different, different types of intelligence that in some cultures, logical mathematical intelligence is really selected for, and that's what's considered IQ. And in other cultures, it's spatial intelligence, being able to navigate by the stars, you know, or musical intelligence or interpersonal intelligence or whatever. Exactly. 
Well, I kind of had had a little bit in, in most areas, uh, not everything, but um, uh, I mean, I, I'm creative in my own ways. I never thought of myself as much of an art student, though, but uh, mathematics, science, uh, English and, and the fine arts, I was very big on and um, and music, especially, uh, which is primarily why I became an MC and all that stuff. So and, and, but, and yet you also have this electrical engineering side. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I built I actually you're going to probably be surprised when I tell you this. Uh, well, I, of course, I studied physics in high school and and chemistry. And as such, I um, I was big on designing my own loudspeakers. Uh, the first set that I came up with uh, was of a base reflex design, which was much more efficient than the acoustic suspension speakers that I was using that I had bought when I was really, really young, for four, really young, like four years earlier. I mean, it's, it wasn't really that much younger, but, but anyway, um, uh, what I've discovered was that they just didn't have the efficiency that I really wanted. And I was, I had an amplifier uh, that was uh, 1200 watts and I needed, I wanted more acoustical power. So uh, what I discovered was, was I could transform those loudspeakers. I could use the same drivers and design horn loaded loudspeakers and be able to, of course, not only produce more sound pressure level, but actually throw that sound much further than bass reflex loudspeakers, which was precisely what I was looking forward to. And so that's what I did. And, um, and then I, of course, scaled that up. I built I ended up with, uh, I had actually five uh, entire light show and, and sound systems. And uh, the problem was always finding uh, talented uh, DJs and MCs that, that would actually be able to utilize their talents and, and so forth to the full uh, spectrum that they had available to them. Uh, most, most, most people that came through these doors saying they wanted to be a DJ, uh, they... They didn't want to work. They, you know, they they expected somebody to be able to give them plenty of jobs where they only had to spend three or four hours and and then come in Monday for a paycheck or or whatnot. They didn't realize the the actual dedication and commitment required. But anyway, um, well, I, I want to bring this back to uh, uh, sort of the big picture, human nature, the big picture, and then an impermanence and death. I, uh, Akali okay. and I are going to go do some hiking uh, in one of our favorite forests here in a little bit. So I, I want to sort of begin winding this down. Okay. Uh, as for whether the descent that uh, this was in your one of your questions here, uh, do you think that this was in some way inevitable uh, and could the descent have been avoided? And I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't see it much differently than I do life in general. Uh, yes. Everyone has specific growth periods, just like energy growth. And therefore, that of civilization and industrial civilization after the industrial revolution, and they have their own spurts and waiting periods. Uh, a person generally reaches their peak somewhere between the ages of 35 and 55, and then faces decline thereafter. You know, mm -hmm. so we reached many different peaks with regard to different energy mediums. Uh, ones with wood usually reach their peak once the easy to get trees were all cut down locally, or uh, regionally, the same way the easy to get oil here in the U.S. was gone after 1970. So the globe reached peak conventional oil around 2005, which caused the Great Recession in 2008. And then we went on to the granddaddy of peaks, including non-conventional extraction in October of 2018. So at this point, there's nothing but degrowth to look forward to. Uh, exactly. And, and this idea that we're going to build back better and all this other nonsense. No, it's just, it's crazy. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and any, any finite resource has a limited time function, no differently than life itself. So no, I, I don't see any possible way to have actually avoided this decline in society and culture. Uh, and it's no different than any of the other civilizations, which collapsed in history. It yep. was, is, and will be inevitable as long as society chooses to try to continue unsustainable practices such as civilization. Yeah, so. exactly. Anthropocentrism is inherently unsustainable. Right. Now, as far as discussing whether or not these things are relevant, 
uh, I think they're very relevant to discuss. Uh, I think that way too many things have consistently been taken off the discussion platform, which only allowed those things to persist. Uh, and I suppose one could claim that if only we had remained hunter gatherers, that perhaps uh, humanity could still be sustainable. But I seriously doubt that myself, given what has transpired. In fact, I read an article uh, yesterday uh, that had to do with indigenous uh, tribes, indigenous peoples, uh, how they, here in the U.S., uh, how they actually brought the bison population into decline before the European uh, conquerors. Uh, even got here. Send that to me because some of that is bullshit, I think. Uh, I'm familiar with one person who tried to make that argument and it was completely insane. So yeah, I'd, I be curious, I'd be curious to know. So so please uh, send me in an email uh, that. Sure, I will. But, yeah. um, but uh, we were hunter-gatherers and we developed tools such as the wheel and fire and spears. So from my perspective, it's kind of rather silly to think that we would have remained sustainable. Uh, yeah, I think no, given did. the same same circumstances, we would have made the exact same choices we made when we made them. So, and, and I think that many people forget that we actually lack agency in most circumstances. Yep. Um, like we were talking before about the dopamine addicts. Um, certainly some people can maintain uh, a certain adherence to their own principles and, and maintain a certain amount of agency, but society wide yeah, that exactly. that's a whole different story altogether i think and and most because most people generally make the same choices over and over again uh and rarely do they forego those dopamine hits <laughs> all too well yes well okay speaking of dopamine hits so i, I want to ask make sure that you know if we don't cover any other question i want to make sure you address this how do you eric wake up each day knowing what you know and sharing what you do and having just really immersed yourself in this, this sort of post doom worldview that's quite comprehensive and quite integrative, um, but would be what would, you know, what scares the shit out of a lot of people until they come to peace with it. But how do you, how, what, what inspires you? What wakes you up each day? Grateful to be alive and grateful to contribute as you can, like what tools or practices or exercises or ways of thinking or habits that you have developed that uh, support you on a day by day, week by week basis. Well, I think the live and love now is is uh, completely and entirely uh, not only appropriate but very very much something that I try to adhere to myself. Um, the this little carrying on that you hear in the background. Come here, people want to see you. Say uh, hi. Yeah. Say hi. <laughs> That's Lexi. And she's yep. looking for she's looking for some attention, yeah, of course. Sure. Um, I actually had to um, bring her to the office every day because um, she's she's actually uh, pretty high maintenance. And uh, my significant other thought that uh, well, you know, well, I, maybe she didn't think I don't know. She just wanted a dog. Um, we got a baby gate and put it in uh, the kitchen. And uh, one day she proceeded to destroy the linoleum in there, trying to dig underneath the thing to get out. And um, of course, after a few more episodes with uh, destruction, like one time she uh, took a whole box of Kleenex and shredded it all over the living room. And another time she unrolled all the toilet paper. And you know how dogs are. Oh yeah. And I, I told her, I said, look, she needs uh, more attention. Uh, so I will take her uh, to the office every day and that will prevent her from destroying uh, all your bills and everything. Cause that, that was the other thing. One time we went out to dinner, came back and she had chewed up uh, her Verizon bill on the, on the dining room table. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, that was, uh, that was kind of funny, but that's when I realized that, that, you know, I couldn't just put her in the kennel and, and be done with it. Uh, every day and and she was kind of being disruptive to the neighbors she yeah. her whines in the morning when oh, we would yeah. get ready to leave she oh boy wow she was loud so yeah so uh so yeah that's part of it um of course uh getting out in nature like you were just talking about doing some hiking um that uh, not just hiking but being staying in shape is, is also 
uh, very pertinent, a good exercise program, and which allows me to continue to do the, the hikes that I do, like in the mountains and so forth, because some of these, some of these fire towers I visit, uh, yeah. that's a pretty strenuous hike. And, yeah, no, uh, I, I, I do those yeah. myself and I like them, yeah. And if you're not in, don't stay in shape, you, you're going to have a hard time getting up there. But the coming down is not too bad, but getting up there, whoo, yeah, it's first one every year is like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think that uh, music is a big one. Um, talking in the group every once in a while, if I feel that I uh, am, am needing to share something about just life in general, you know, um, I've, I've shared some different things, usually feelings about um, how people are handling the information or um, like I did with that, that article I just mentioned about the indigenous cultures. Right. Uh, I used to be a big proponent of the indigenous cultures because they, first off, they have the seven generations uh, thing uh, where they look they look further into the future than what most people do today. Most people are very much just right here and now. You know, they they can't think more than uh, maybe a, a week or two in advance. And I tend to think not just in weeks, but months, years. Uh, and in some cases, well, of course, you know, obviously reading all the geological information I do, I, I sometimes think in geological time frames, right. which are millions of years, you know, and so it's it's that's uh, that's those are some of the things that I think uh, help me. And of course, eating as healthy as I can. Um, I've reduced my meat intake, uh, trying to uh, again take that that carbon reduction into into uh, to the heart of the things and so forth. I'm not d dead set against meat eating or anything. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't I don't criticize other people for what they want to eat. I mean. Right. That's to me, I think that's a personal choice. And I recognize the simple fact that let's face it, it if everybody did turn vegan, we then we would still be in a, a shortage situation because of not enough land to grow all the vegetables on. So, no, I mean, exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. One of the things that I, I notice is that there are personal choices, often ethical choices, that people make for themselves around, you know, some people choose not to fly, some people choose not to drive, some people choose not to have children, some people choose not to eat meat, uh, and so forth. And those are all great choices. I mean, you know, and it's, it could be arguably, the, arguably the case could be made that if everybody took that on, it could make a, a, a difference. The truth of the matter is when you understand human nature and culture and everything else, everybody's not going to do it. Uh, even the majority of people aren't going to do it, certainly in not any time scale that anything else could be made. But the challenge is, if I choose not to fly, it's kind of not easy for me to not be judgmental towards people who still fly. If I don't eat meat, it's kind of hard for me to not be judgmental towards people who still eat meat. And so to my mind, our time is limited. Frankly, I've got better ways to spend my time and energy than to nurture judgmentalness towards others. So right. I encourage people to make whatever choices they can that allows them to look themselves in the mirror and feel good, um, but then not invest a lot of time and energy and money and, and uh, whatever, judging other people for making different choices. Well, it, this will probably uh, surprise you. I've never, never flown. I've you've never, never what? In, I've never flown, never been in an airport. Oh, you've never flown. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. I would like to try it someday, but uh, you know, I just really yeah. haven't had the, I mean, where would I fly to? I mean, yeah. uh, when, when I went to Alaska, I drove up there, you know, yeah. Melanie flew, she flew, uh, and I picked her up at the Anchorage airport, but, but I didn't, uh, you know, well, how can you, you, you really, I wouldn't have been able to, I, we needed to have the truck cause that's where we camp out of. So, you know, but it's, um, it's just one of those things where the only place really that I can think of where I could fly to would be uh, probably Hawaii, maybe. Yeah, you right. Know. Yep, and, I've done that. Yep. Yeah, Connie's given up flying entirely. She'll never fly again, I'm quite sure. And, and it's possible that I won't. Although, if, you know, one of my parents dies. My father lives in New York. My mother lived down in Key Largo. And if one of them dies and I'm on the opposite side of the country, you know, I, I might fly for their funeral or whatever. I, I'm not going to be so 
committed to the principle of not flying that I piss off all my family members. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, all right. Well, Eric, any anything that you anything that you'd like to say to bring this uh, this conversation to completion? Um, well, uh, just say and, and, and by all means, since you wrote out responses, feel free to email me because I'd love to see them. But you know, I don't want this to be a two hour long conversation. Right, right. No, actually, um, I'm going to put down uh, the, this impermanence and death. Uh, because you've you've uh, this was, I think, an important question. And um, something that I find that helps is stoicism. Yeah, uh, the stoics had ways of looking at life situation and ways of thinking, which I think can be highly uh, beneficial to a person. Of course, everyone has his or her own ways of discovering spiritual guidance and, and healing, but music and nature, uh, I think, are, are two very good ways of healing and, and bringing peace into one's aura. And um, as far as acceptance and, and gifts, um, well, my first, my first thing would be to describe mere acceptance to me <laughs> but uh, but i think acceptance is just part of what accompanies one's journey to understanding comprehending and accepting the predicaments that we face uh, coming to acceptance of these predicaments may coming to acceptance of of life's other situations more palatable easier to digest and less disrupting and, uh, and one can see similar patterns or other visualizations and, and come to an aha moment, you know, when the light bulb flashes brightly, and then uh, be able to apply those same lessons learned to a new situation that they are yeah. involved in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, well, just so you know uh, where that came from. Of course, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's, you know, pretty famous stages of grief or, you know, denial, anger, bargaining you know, depression and acceptance. And then Paul Traferka, who's a, just a really cherished, I just love that man and, and, his, and his writings. He's got a blog that if you haven't encountered Paul Traferka yet. Uh, oh, no, he, he was one of the first people I encountered. Oh, good. He, okay, good. He's good, one good, of my good. friends on Facebook. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah I, exactly. I love his, uh, his material. And, uh, and I actually have quite a few of his articles on my blog as well. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Yeah. So his his sense of finding the gift, that's where that, you know, beyond mere acceptance came from was just sort of inviting people to, you know, have they experienced something that would be more along the lines of finding the gift, which for many people is beyond sort of acceptance. Right. Yeah. And uh, of course, I, I wrote all kinds of stuff out here. I, I did every one, but I think the the last one that you wrote uh, that you just added uh, last year uh, was about the coronavirus pandemic, yeah. and um, uh, and I think it's important to point out that disease being one of the major predicaments we face as a symptom of ecological overshoot, exactly. and COVID nineteen is just the first major oh, pandemic yes. that Absolutely. we have to look forward to. Uh, this is going to go on probably for years. I don't I don't see. I don't see us wiping it out. We we kind of lost that opportunity early on uh, because we never had it. Yeah, right. Because of that famous denial. <laughs> uh, but uh, there'll be many more pandemics as time moves forward. Uh, some of these may be caused by manufactured viruses or pathogens. Some might be naturally occurring in animals, uh, and some may be caused by ancient viruses, fungi or bacteria that have been frozen away in absolutely, absolutely. For thousands of years. So, and, and they're going to reappear because of the thawing of the polar ice caps. And so, exactly. and don't even, don't even get me started on methane emissions. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I suspect you and I will have another conversation uh, and uh, yeah, we can talk about methane and, and uh, permafrost and Arctic and blue ocean events and all that kind of stuff. For more information about this project, go to postdoom.com.